Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ведущих стран Европы. Yeah, we need the NATO. We are present everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Oliker. And I'm Hugh Pope. And we are here in the studio with Azadeh Moveni, who is the Crisis Group Project Director for Gender in Violent Conflict. Azadeh is also the author of Guest House for Young Widows, The Women of ISIS, and has a wealth of experience looking at wars from a variety of perspectives. She used to be a journalist and considering how gender affects and is affected by conflict situations. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me with you. You've lately been working a lot on Syria, and the book you wrote is focused primarily on women who went to Syria. The war continues. It ebbs and it flows, but the violence has not stopped. And the problem that has emerged and that you have been thinking a lot about is what do you do with the people who went off to fight? And different governments, different countries have taken different approaches. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on? Of course. So we have in the northeast of Syria, which is a area of the country that is outside of the control largely of the Syrian government. It is run by a Kurdish and associated other ethnic group militia. Mm -hmm. But up until very recently, up until the Turkish incursion a few months ago, it was sort of in the de facto control of the United States. All of this matters because uh, the roughly 13,500 men, women, and children who are foreign, who are affiliated with ISIS, uh, have been detained there. And they remain detained there. And the question of who is responsible for these people, what is their legal status, has largely come back to who does that area even belong to. It's been very complicated because the Syrian Democratic Forces, the the Kurdish Arab group uh, that that runs that part of Syria is seen as a non-state actor. So it's very complicated for European countries, of course, who are mindful of Turkey's sensitivities about this group. It's affiliated with the PKK, which Turkey and, and much of Europe brands as a terrorist organization. There are layers of complications, not simply around what do we do with these people, But how do we engage those who are protecting them uh, or detaining them, depending on on how you view their status? And that is also a contested thing. Are they prisoners of war? They're not internally displaced. They're not seeking asylum anywhere. And delivering any kind of humanitarian aid to them has also been very complex because they are largely seen as affiliated with a terrorist group. So the UN has been very hands-off as well. And it's fallen to a contractor for the US State Department, for example, to manage the camps where they're held. So that's the kind of legal, political kind of theater that all of this is operating in the backdrop of. At the kind of forefront of it, and and I was there just a few months ago, it's a massive humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. How does it break down of women, children, men? So men are held in separate detention centers in prisons. Women and children are in two camps. It's hard to even begin to describe how abhorrent the conditions are. You know, disease is rampant. There is very few medical services. There's, of course, no schools. There are pockets of very militant ISIS women still quite active. So there are areas of these camps where, you know, there is no possibility of even delivering services. Um, And there are children mixed in, you know, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, amongst all of this. The foreigners are kept uh, in a camp called Al Hol, and they're kept in a separate area than than the areas that hold Syrian and Iraqi displaced people who are also considered affiliated with ISIS. And that is the area that is particularly impossible to detain securely. You know, there's constant movement of people in and out. A recent report by the Defense Department said that ISIS is able to easily smuggle in and out of that area. And it cannot be accessed by services because when MSF or other humanitarians go in, their their vans have been attacked, their staff have been attacked. So this whole uh, sort of population in there is really kind of hostage to a small group of militants. So in a way, I mean, it's been called in a sensationalistic way, like a pocket of a caliphate that still exists. But there's really no way of resolving this because of, I'm sure we'll talk about the problem of sending these people back to their countries of origin. And yet, as I did, when you were there, you came to a very firm conclusion, which drilled down to the idea of women and children first. But the situation you're describing does not seem 
necessarily to have thrown that out logically. Can you tell us how you arrived at that conclusion, that that was the best policy to follow? Women and children first, meaning women and children should be evacuated from these places first. That they should be repatriated, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was partly in response to field research I did in various European capitals and saw that the, you know, when you would speak to European officials, the idea of taking the men back because they're all viewed as combatants. You know, ISIS had mandatory military training for men. The vast majority of men did fight. Um, The possibility or the even the willingness to entertain taking them back is is absolutely zero. You know, the European officials will tell you it's suicide, it's political suicide, there are no solutions for the men at the time being. Women and children, there is more room to give. And so partly we put this forward, I put this forward, because it seemed the most pragmatic course, because women are not a monolithic group. Many had no operational rules. Also, many of them were very much victims of ISIS. They were married over and over again. They were required to marry. You know, if their husband had died in battle, they were forced to remarry. Some of them had to marry four times. They have children from four different men. So even though some of them joined this group voluntarily, many of them suffered very much at its hands. And when they tried to escape, they were in prison. They had their children taken away. So women uh, are not really monolithic. Their roles are very varied. Many of them were, were victims. And I think there is more of a willingness to contemplate taking some of them back. And also the number are, are smaller. So it's partly pragmatic. It seemed as though governments would be amenable to entertaining that argument. And when you took that message to officials in the capitals of Europe and in Brussels, what reaction did you get? It's evolved a little bit over time. I think you, what you'll hear very often is that you know, there is a difference in attitude amongst elected politicians who really are fearful of taking returnees back and then having an operation or a terrorist attack committed on their watch, because that will mean, of course, certain electoral defeat. So much of this, I think, is driven by politics rather than a reading of, you know, what is more secure? Are we safer bringing these people home, putting them under watch and knowing where they are versus just kind of leaving them there where they could make their way back undetected? I think European capitals on women and and children are looking very much on a case-by-case basis. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that lots have come back on their own, so-called independent returns. So the security agencies in all of these countries are already dealing with this. And they are dealing with small numbers again. So they know, like if the Germans have 100 women there, they'll say 13 are really bad apples and we don't want that 13 back, but the rest we think we could deal with. So I think they are kind of dragging their feet, but they know that they will eventually, even because court cases, families are bringing and suing governments to bring, you know, their daughters or their relatives back that, you know, some will eventually, you know, be brought back or come themselves. At what point do the children start being men and women, according to all of these governments? What's the age cutoff? Well, in a way, there's two ways of answering that. Mm-hmm. So the question is, you know, at what point can a child or a human be radicalized? And that's a that's a complicated question. But I'm just curious how the, these countries are looking at this, right? Because it's an important question. If a, a 14-year-old, right, is not an adult, but a 14-year-old may very well have been a combatant. So France, for example, I believe, is taking back children under six. Mm -hmm. So the clear preference is for very small children for whom a kind of risk Mm -hmm. of operational experience or even kind of indoctrination is quite small. The Syrian Democratic Forces, the Kurdish militia that controls that area, is already taking boys away, though. So boys who are reaching the age of adolescence, 12, 13, kind of disappear from these camps and are taken away to a separate so-called de-radicalization facility, which is also quite scary because it's not clear where they go. Are they being accounted for? Do their mothers know where they are? So it's also, you know, another facet of the very kind of fractured and difficult nature of securing Mm -hmm. any rights to this population is that the young boys are sort of taken away. And that's one of the ideas that some people have put forward Forward, right, is that why not do de-radicalization programs with these people there, and then you can take back whichever ones it worked with, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, one idea that keeps getting kind of put forward, sometimes by the U.S. government, sometimes by others, is, you know, well, it's such a conundrum bringing any of these people back. Let's just improve their lot while they're there. Let's make sure that the camps are more secure and let's provide services so that they have some minimal health care and some education. But what we've seen 
on the ground is that actually the possibility of that is declining because of access to the northeast of Syria. Recent UN resolution has made it even harder. And it, it's simply not possible. There's all of these restrictions on new build reconstruction in Syria, mm-hmm. largely imposed by the United States. that makes it impossible to even build, for example, a detention facility where you would kind of move these quite militant or violent women so that you could provide some services to the rest. So that the myriad of, of obstructions. So I think to be very real, these detention camps are are going to get worse. Um, they're going to be more insecure. And the prospect of doing any de-radicalization or even, you know, providing basic services there is really elusive. I think it's disingenuous of policymakers to suggest that it's feasible and that they can kind of absolve themselves of their obligations to their nationals in that way. Now you've said that governments look at the different categories of, of women and divide them into good and bad apples as such. Do, do you agree with that perspective? It's very complex in that... You know, there could be a woman who had significant operational experience, was an active recruiter, but who might also have originally been coerced in going, might have gone as a minor. There were a number of women from the UK, for example, who were groomed, really, if we're going to be specific about what happened to them when they were very young. You know, I spoke to families of Tunisian girls who were recruited at 13 and 15, you know, young girls from high schools in London. So, I mean, maybe they did go on to have operational roles that security forces would then kind of really worry about. But are they also not child soldiers of a kind because they were recruited when they were so young? But the men too, right? Some of them were recruited in similar ways. Yes, yes, and exactly. And and I think this is where the kind of gender sensitivity that we see, especially in terms of designing rehabilitation programs or even thinking about how to deal with this very complex population falters, because I think there's willingness to think about nuance around women and, and the ways that the pathways coerced or otherwise through which they were drawn to ISIS. But I think for young men, there's there's very little willingness to kind of share that nuance. So as the gender analyst and gender expert for crisis group, and you look at this problem, what do you feel that you can do? It seems very intractable, the problem that you're trying to solve on a returnee question, but are there things that you can do in terms of shaping language or shaping thinking that are really making an impact? That's an important question. And I think that there's too little potential given to trying to shift public opinion around this. I mean, I think the potential for encouraging a public that is seemingly like intractably hostile to any returnees and politicians often sort of say, well, we our hands are tied because our publics, you know, would vote us out, you know, in Norway, a government, you know, was shaken by taking returnees back. But it, it is not intractable because by sort of not using language like jihadi brides. This language that sort of suggests that women sort of had no agency at all, or on the other hand, just monsters, dehumanizing language. You know, you see lots of headlines in the UK about, you know, ISIS babies, as though there could be such a thing. So avoiding this dehumanizing language that then primes public sentiment to be fearful and to view this whole population as monolithic, dangerous, and a threat. Um, I think avoiding this kind of language, and by politicians sort of making a case to say, look, they're not all a dangerous monolith, can prepare publics for sometimes uncomfortable policy decisions around repatriation. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and I'm Olga Olaker with Hugh Pope talking to Azadeh Moaveni about people who joined ISIS, whether they will return to their homes, and gender and violent conflict. So what do you do with these people when you get them home? Is there a body of knowledge, maybe from child soldier experiences, maybe from something else that tells you how to integrate these communities, right? I mean, there's a legal argument that, hey, they're your nationals, take them, put them in prison, do whatever it is you're going to do with criminals. But then they're the ones who aren't criminals, then they're the ones who are children, then they're the ones who are in some sort of gray zone. What should governments be doing other than taking them? This is such a contested but topical question because this question of rehabilitation and and de-radicalization. Does this even exist? Can you do this? Um, And and in the UK, we've had an attack just last week by a convicted terrorist offender who was released early, who went through a so-called de-radicalization program, but but re-offended, which has thrown up this question of, you know, can you de-radicalize adults? Does it even make sense to think about a category of violence that's so ideological that the person can then be cured from it? 
I would argue not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I think in, in terms of um, this particular population of ISIS-affiliated people, there's you know, multiple challenges. There's the legal ones. Many of them simply cannot be prosecuted because there's no evidence against them. And they are just being monitored closely. I think mm-hmm. there's 300 women who've come back to the UK from the ISIS caliphate who have not been prosecuted. And, and when I was in the northeast of Syria at this camp, and I sort of asked the women, I sort of said, you know, you realize that your home countries all think you're dangerous. Like, what would you say to them? What would you say to someone who was suspicious of your return? And so many of them were so young. And they said, well, we came when we were 18 and we were stupid. And maybe we kind of still believe in some of it. But now we're mothers and we want to save our children from growing up in this disease-infested, you know, hell. And we've just moved on. We're in a different place in our lives. Um, And I think that's an uncomfortable way of having to kind of accept that someone might not be violent again simply because they've moved on. But I think we see that that has happened. Children who come back as orphans are harder because in certain countries, I think their placement with foster families is, is difficult. In France, there's been a reported rejection of a lot of these children and their rehabilitation, their inclusion in families and schools is, is not going very well. There's a resistance to putting them with families because the idea is that well, if the family let you know, the parents of this child right. go off to ISIS. Why wouldn't they do right. it again? These grandparents raised their parents. Why would you give them more children to raise? Precisely. <laughs> so that's a difficulty. Mm-hmm. And and I think social workers are having to sort of make what's in the best interest of the child calculations, very often with the big cultural gap to have to bridge. You know, a social worker who's, you know, has no background in immigrant families, different religious kind of context, like how do you read whether a family is safe enough to be? So massive challenges. But I think we're seeing that in lots of countries, you know, women have gone back, children have gone back. And, you know, for now, things have been okay. What about other countries that you've worked in, Azadi? You've been working a lot in Nigeria. Is there any models there that we can take and look at, find some new policies from? So... When I worked on the return of women from Boko Haram Mm -hmm. in northeast Nigeria, we looked and went and visited. I went and visited some of the rehabilitation programs um, and talked with staff and women who had gone through them. um, Many of them, or or at least some of the flagship programs, were modeled on domestic European kind of counterterrorism programs, which had a very focused understanding of violence is driven by ideology. So then, therefore, the rehabilitation program was a sort of exorcism program. Um, And so I remember speaking to a young Nigerian woman who said, yes, they put me in this room, and this man who didn't even speak my language held up the Quran, and he said, can you name the bad bits of this book? Because you must not (laughs) follow the bad bits. And she, of course, was horrified. I mean, it's blasphemous. You don't say parts of the book are bad. But this idea that you know, there's this ideological religious reading. And as long as you can fix that, then the person can be put down a path of moderate Islam and everything, you know, will be resolved. And a third of the women who went through this particular program went straight back to Boko Haram because the understanding of what they needed in their life to stay out of the group, to be rehabilitated was so partial. You know, sometimes it's just, here's a sewing kit. Like if you can be, feed your kids at a subsistence level, you won't go back. Or, you know, let's fix the bad religious thoughts in your head and you won't go back. Whereas really, you know, the whole kind of backdrop to women's lives in that part of Nigeria, none of the structural problems, the lack of education, the the deep, deep poverty, the basic neglect of the state and corruption, none of that has gone away. So there's no life of dignity or or opportunity. So women can kind of cycle back. And, And these programs that try to isolate like one factor economic livelihoods or, you know, moderate Islam, you know, really falter because the big picture that, you know, created the potential for such a group to draw women has not changed at all. So you have spent a lot of time looking at how gender affects both uh, people in conflict and policy responses to the conflict. What are your pet peeves? What are the things that really frustrate you that governments consistently get wrong? Because it's a big thing now, right, to incorporate gender into your policies, but you can do it well and you can do it badly. So what do they do badly? My view is that there is a far too big or excessive of a focus on women as peace builders. This kind of Mm -hmm. idea that we can fund women peace builders and civil society activists and by the sheer force of their peacefulness as women, they will resolve these 
big, deadly, intractable conflict. And does that make you want to kill people? It makes me <laughs> very, very angry um, because it will not concede that, you know, and, and it places a burden on women, that women mm-hmm. must somehow solve all of this. And, it, and it's also deeply patronizing, I think, because, you know, women are victims of these evil men and women are peaceful. Therefore, they must fix the problem by being peaceful women, whereas women and men both participate in these insurgencies. I mean, they maybe are drawn to them in, in slightly different ways, according to their gender, but their feminine will not be the key to solving the conflict. And I think it places a massive burden and I think it misreads or refuses to entertain why these conflicts happen in the first place. So it feels really dysfunctional as though you're in like a family where everything is wrong and they're kind of just telling you to put your head down and go along with it because it's normal. So you're uncomfortable with the argument that men cause war and women cause peace? Yes. (laughs) Does that mean that there are no gender-specific ways of doing things that can be changed as a result of this new lens that you're bringing to all the conflict reporting that you're doing? There are absolutely gender-specific ways, but they're the harder ones, and they may not be the ones that we can easily persuade governments to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, persuading the government of Nigeria to fund the northeast quadrant of its country and provide education to all of its citizens, but particularly women, can we secure that? Can we achieve that? You know, they're they're the big things. Um, And that's why I feel we end up kind of promoting the idea of change at the margins. But I think that the more ambitious and, and very much sort of mapped on the demands or the frustrations or the desires that women say they have, that kind of change is possible. But it's very often linked to big structures like relationships of of arms trades with countries that are essentially then entirely militarized and and they're harder and they're embedded. And I think that's why we always end up going back to, you know, women as peace builders. Mm -hmm. What about the argument that equality uh, in societies, including gender equality, is more likely to promote peace? I am skeptical Mm -hmm. about that argument, partly because, you know, I, I see it very much not simply a question of equality, but development. You know, I think there very much there's a notion that Western-style liberal gender equality will bring peace, whereas from my perspective, you know, I come from Iran, I come from a country that politically became more inclusive and stable when women had far greater access to education and their development and their health and their literacy improved. And that made the greatest step change in their access to public life. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me to sort of that argument kind of has only sort of one understanding of what equality is and skips the massively important stages of development, literacy and education that then can, I think, actually enable that kind of equality, and also political participation, because how do you enable women to legislate for less discriminatory laws unless there's a political process that understands the notion of citizenship? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that there are important ways of getting there, um, and skipping ahead to gender equality uh, may not be the only way. So how much has changed for you then as someone working on conflicts? You've been a reporter for many years. You've written books, wonderful books about the Middle East. And um, you've now done this gender spectacles, if you like, to look at things from that angle. How are you seeing the world differently now? I'm trying to imagine how this whole agenda of women, peace and security, and how these development of feminist foreign policies can coexist with the world as I've known it and reported on it as a journalist for 20 years. I'm Iranian by background, and and I've worked on the Middle East for many years. I mean, I worked on Iraq before the 2003 invasion. I covered the 2003 invasion. You know, I've lived through and watched You know, the women in in my country, certainly, the women in neighboring Iraq, absolutely decimated by sanctions policies, for example. Mm -hmm. And I I don't understand how countries that put forward sort of women, peace and security policies that, that say they have feminist foreign policies can then use these foreign policy tools that decimate and diminish women's prospects. So it's really sort of taking what I've witnessed as an observer and and as a participant, you know, as someone who's from a society like this, that has gone through that, and then trying to see how I can synchronize or harmonize that with looking at a policy level European Western approach that sort of claims it wants to do good in ways that, you know, often doesn't 
align with what it does end up doing. So I'm trying to see if at the theoretical level, what I'm working on can ever be aligned with what I've reported and lived as a reporter and as a woman. As a day, thank you so much. I think that's the perfect stopping point for this conversation. So we're conveniently out of time. But thank you. I think this was a really fascinating conversation. And I personally am so pleased that we at Crisis Group are trying to do a better job of understanding all of the nuances of these issues as we look at the conflicts in which men and women fight and are victimized and survive. So thank you. So as always in closing, we want to thank Miranda Sonics, who uh, makes sure that we are ready when Hugh and I walk into the studio and we know what we're doing. War and Peace is part of the Europod Podcast Production Network, so check out some of the other podcasts as well. And we are grateful to them for making sure that we sound good. And finally, our biggest thanks, as always, to you, our listeners. And it's goodbye for me too, Hugh Pope. And if you'd like to follow Azadeh's work, just go to Crisis Group's website, crisisgroup.org, and click on the Global Issues page, and there you'll find all our work on gender, security, and conflict. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. <laughs>